Hey everyone, so today we're going to be talking about The Iron King by Maurice Drouin. Today I'm going to be talking about a book I just recently read in the beginning of February, and that is The Iron King by Maurice Drouin. Uh, and a couple of people have actually asked me my opinions on this book, so I was going to do an entire video just on this particular book. So let's get started. So The Iron King is a book that takes place in the 1300s with King Philip the Fair and the Hundred Years War. And this book takes place towards the end of King Philip's reign, so uh, there's a lot that's happened between him and England, which is why it sparks the Hundred Year War. So I'm going to be giving you a little bit of background information uh, on this particular book so you're sort of already caught up to date with what is happening in in this book and why the events of this book is so important to the rest of the series and actually our history. Even though this is a historical fiction book, it is extremely accurate as to what happened, like the actual events that happened during the time and during the reign of King Philip. So let's get into the history part of this whole review. We're going to talk about some of the events that precursored what happens in the book. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is King Philip and his relationship with England because that is the most important relationship in this entire book. King Edward was a vassal to King Philip. Following a naval incident that happened between the Normans and the English, Philip summoned Edward to the French court. The English king sought to negotiate the matter and sent ambassadors to Paris, but they were turned away and Edward was addressed by Philip as a duke, not a king, a vassal and nothing more. The naval incident that happened between the two of them was actually an international incident and not one that happened inside of France. So Edward got pissed. Edward sent his brother Edmund to the king's court. Now Edmund was King Philip's cousin and stepfather-in-law. He sent him over to kind of conjure up an agreement between the French family and the English family. This way they could avert war. So this agreement pretty much was for King Edward to give up his land um, in France and give it back to the French king as a sign of submission to the French king as all that was all pretty much he could do as a duke of the area in France that he was a duke of. He was duke of Aquitaine, 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 French. And in return Philip would forgive him and um restore his land after like some grace period that they had settled upon. Now both King Edward and Edmund, which is his brother, were completely deceived. They had no intention to return the land to the English monarch, which was King Edward. So pretty much Edward took away his dukedom, he took away all of his land, took away all of his possessions, all of his money, and just left him with nothing. So Edward was just super pissed at this point. So between a lot of battles, back and forth between the French and the English actually end up costing a lot of money. It was very costly for both of the monarchies. So King Philip of France actually ended up owing a lot of money to a lot of investors, which we'll talk about that in just a second. Both sides came together for the Treaty of Paris. After this treaty was signed between the King Philip of France and King uh, Edward of England, oh my god, names, King Philip offered his daughter Isabella uh, to be betrothed to King Edward's son which was the prince of wales by giving away his daughter you would think okay everything's good and fine now no because france and england for some reason just really hate each other forever and ever and ever so there's always a war between the two of them and this only just continued to kind of snowball out of control until the 100 years war happened so of course all these wars had to cost pretty much france was kind of becoming a little broke and who were they actually getting money from the knights templars and the jews and pretty much stripped all of their money from them and just sent them on their way and was like you can't be here and he pretty much got all of their money and that's how he became rich again so the story begins right here as the knights uh the knights templar are captured the jewish are no longer in france and isabella is married off to the king of england so we're right around the point in which the story begins so now i'm actually going to get into the synopsis of the book uh so yes here we go another little minor history lesson but it's pretty much just the synopsis of the book so this book is pretty much the last couple of years or months i don't really recall of king philip's reign and rule so yes so this book pretty much follows two different kinds of plot lines the first plot line is with queen isabella of england uh, which is queen philip's daughter finding out that her sisters in law are having adulterous affairs with 
who knows? They're trying to, she's trying to figure this out. She's given this information by her cousin. Uh, I think it's Robert du Artois. And then he went to go visit her uh, and give her this brand new information. I'm gonna put this down because what's the point of me holding it? So she plans this whole scheme with her cousin to trap and find out who the, who the men are that they're having an affair with and to find out if they actually are officially having an affair with these men because that is huge. That's a huge deal because each of these women are going to be potential queens of France. The next plot line is between the king and the Knights Templars and um, all of the events that occur after the fact of him capturing the Knights Templars. So I can't get it too much into that because then I would be spoiling a little bit of the story. So that was the initial gist of what's happening in the story. Now a couple of my thoughts on this book. So just like the quote says here in the front, this is the original Game of Thrones. I have to agree with that wholeheartedly. I do see this as the original Game of Thrones. There are so many hidden gems in this book that I completely see as inspirations to George R. R. Martin. Um, like Arya's prayer, that's there's somebody in this book is saying a prayer very much like Arya's. It's awesome. I really did enjoy this read. I had so much fun uh, reading this and I also listened to the audiobook of, of this book, which I do recommend the audiobook um, of this particular book. It was a lot of fun getting into the story and um, cat. <laughs> and there goes my cat. What a weirdo. Um, I did very much enjoy this book. I loved all of the relationships between all of the characters. There were a few characters in this book that I actually didn't quite care for. I do understand that in later on books they will probably play an important role so I should be t paying attention to them. Um, but overall the characters were super well written and um, I knew what everyone's intentions were but I didn't. So that's where it got me. That's where the George R. R. Martin comes in because you think somebody's gonna say something or feel something and they really don't. Overall my thoughts on this book is that it was super well written. Everything fit and flowed together. I love the historical accuracy of this book. The types of characters you get in this book I felt bad for a lot of them. I hated a lot of them. I had all of the feelings. I do see how George R. R. Martin got a lot of his inspiration from this book. Um, it, to me, feels like a realistic, a little watered down version of um, the A Song of Ice and Fire series. The reason why I say watered down is because since this book was written in the 1950s, um, I feel that he, the author couldn't write um, certain scenes in the way that he would have wanted to or would have been edited out. When there's a sex scene or something that arises that would normally in A Song of Ice and Fire be super written into detail about, uh, it just sort of skips it over and it's just like, well, these two were together and they were kissing on the couch. You figure out what they did next. And or maybe the author just made the conscious decision to kind of keep that out. I'm not really sure, um, but... Yes, it was insinuated, but it wasn't ever fully explored, I guess I should say. He does talk a lot about violence in this book, but we don't really see a lot of violence. Like, he's just kind of like, well, this person was tortured today. And then that's it. And then it kind of just keeps going. So, I, I mean, that's not really a negative to the book, but I am saying that if you are expecting a lot of gory or a lot of very mature content in this book, you're not going to get it. This book has a sort of pace of A Song of Ice and Fire, um, so I would recommend it to people who are trying to get into A Song of Ice and Fire um, that wouldn't necessarily pick up on A Song of Ice and Fire straight off the bat because it may be a little bit confusing or um, it could be a little bit too mature in content for them. But I would also recommend this highly, highly, highly if you are a super fan of A Song of Ice and Fire. It's so well done, well done. The only negative I have to say is since this book is written in originally in French, um, a lot of what I feel the author would have written in French is sort of lost in translation. You know, authors put their like certain touch on certain things and I feel that because this is a translated book, um, and it's translated very well, but I feel like because it's a translated book, it, it doesn't have that same sort of soul that most books that would that were written in their native tongue would have. And I just, I really, really adored this book. I can't rave any more about it. These books are coming out little by little in translated 
format. So if you do want to start on a new series, I would go ahead and pick these up. If you speak French, these books are already probably in your local library <laughs> or whatever because they were never really translated into English. So they're being newly translated into English. So yes, recommend it highly. I can't talk any higher on this book. I gave this book a four out of five stars. And the reason I gave it a four out of five stars was really because of the translation. Um, I did feel a little bit kind of the, the wording was a little bit dry and also just some of the characters I just really honestly didn't give a shit about. But yes, I do highly recommend this. And another thing I really, really loved about this book is just how uh, you get to see a glimpse into just how gruesome we are as people um, and how we even did things that you would think were made up in story tales and in books and in fiction. And it just leaves that lasting impression that we can be just as evil as the monsters that we create in books. So I hope you guys enjoyed my book review. I am hoping to do another book review in the future. Uh, please subscribe to my Twitter, my Instagram, uh, my Tumblr, and my Goodreads. And I will see you guys in my next video, hopefully very soon. Bye!